started. So welcome coaches to our seventh Coaches Corner webinar. Hard to believe that we've been doing these for 13, 14 weeks now. Um, just a reminder that we do record these and post them to our YouTube channel. So just want to ensure that everyone knows that we do post these just in case um, your name is on the screen. So we always like to remind you guys that that happens. Uh, we have Brittany Raftis on tonight with us for nutrition. Um, I know there were some coaches on last night as well. We had a skater webinar yesterday and some of the coaches joined us last night. Um, if you want to ask questions, as always, you can type them in the chat box or you can uh, raise your hand on the, um, there, there is a raise hand option that we've used and you can unmute your microphone to ask the questions. Uh, you can ask questions throughout. So there's a couple different topics we're, we're going to cover, and Brittany will go over, that, go over that at the beginning of the presentation. So please feel free to ask questions throughout, but as always, we will have a question and answer period at the end. So Brittany is a registered dietitian. She completed her Master of Science in Food and Nutrition from Western University in 2014. She works as a nutrition consultant with the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario, and she's a registered dietitian at the David Braley Sport Medicine and Rehabilitation Centre at McMaster University. So very excited to have Brittany on with us tonight. Welcome, Brittany. Hi, thank you. It's great to uh, be here. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for joining us. So Brittany did our webinar with our skaters last night, which went awesome. And we've had a ton of great feedback on that. So thanks, Brittany, for coming back again tonight and yeah. joining us with our coaches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just share my screen here. Just give me one sec. Um, okay, great. And then, uh, yeah, we're good to go. So, um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, as Amanda said, uh, there were a few coaches or a couple coaches on last night, uh, for the skaters presentation. So if you were there, uh, today will be uh, a bit of a review. So I've included a lot of the same things that I uh, talked about last night, just so that you as the coach have, uh, are aware of kind of the messaging that was sent to the skaters yesterday. Um, I will go in depth a little bit uh, on a couple of topics, um, but a lot of it will be kind of review from uh, what the skaters were told yesterday as well. And then as Amanda said, if you have any questions at any point, uh, feel free to send them in. So here's our outline for today. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is review macronutrients. So um, that's always kind of what I consider to be like the basic foundation of, of what we should understand for high performance nutrition. Um, I'll talk about meal and snack timing. I'm also gonna talk about uh, REDS, which is an acronym. Um, it's a condition that can happen with chronic underfueling. So um, just something that I wanted to add into tonight's seminar. Um, to kind of be aware of if you haven't heard of it before. I'll cover pre-workout nutrition, post-workout recovery, and then I'll share um, some competition day fueling tips that I shared with the athletes uh, yesterday as well. So first with macronutrients, um, I'm sure most of you have heard of these before, but just to kind of uh, break them down, uh, macronutrients are our carbs, protein, and fats. These are the nutrients in our food where we get calories from or the energy from. So, um, you know, in whatever we eat, whether it's a sandwich, salad, whether it's uh, chicken with rice and steamed broccoli, um, that meal is going to provide us with calories. And those calories are coming from some combination of these three nutrients. So macronutrients being these kind of larger nutrients, carbs, protein, fat, micronutrients being kind of our, our vitamins and minerals. Um, so I'll just review each one similar to uh, how I did in the athletes uh, seminar so that you uh, kind of have that good understanding or as kind of a review or a refresher for those of you who are more kind of familiar. So first, carbohydrates. So there are three types of carbohydrates. Um, we've got our sugar, which is the most basic form of carbohydrate. Um, so, so much so that when we eat something with just sugar, so thinking, I don't know, table sugar, uh, juice, uh, that sugar itself doesn't require much digestion. It doesn't really need to be broken down much. It can pretty much be kind of absorbed and used as energy um, or used for energy as is. Starch, we can think of as just kind of a bigger molecule of sugar. Um, it needs to be digested a little bit, broken down, uh, but eventually can be turned into that simple kind of sugar piece and absorbed and used for energy. 
Fiber is the most complex form of carbohydrate. Um, so, so much so that we don't actually fully digest or break down fiber. We don't absorb calories from fiber. It essentially goes kind of in one end, out the other, uh, relatively unchanged. It has a lot of benefits though for digestion um, and those types of things. Um, and a lot more uh, that we'll talk about in a second, but uh, kind of key take homes here, carbohydrates are gonna be our main source of fuel for both our body, so physical energy, and then our brain, uh, which uses carbohydrates as its main source of energy. So specifically that small sugar molecule um, that we're getting from our foods, that's what our brain is kind of thriving off and using for energy. Muscles for that physical energy um, are also using a stored form of sugar um, for training or energy which is called glycogen. So anything we eat with carbohydrates, um, and I'll show you kind of a snapshot of our sources in our diet, but anything that we eat with carbohydrates will break down, digest, um, and eventually uh, be turned into um, uh, that small sugar molecule that we'll absorb and store in our muscles as, uh, as glycogen. So some considerations uh, for athletes, we've got, uh, Again, carbohydrates are gonna be the main source of fuel during training, competition, uh, and main source or main focus for pre and post-workout fueling. Um, sources of carbohydrate will digest differently. So especially related to the fiber content, high fiber carbohydrates will digest slowly, provide kind of a slow release of that energy. Um, and lower fiber sources of carbohydrate or more processed sources of carbohydrate that juice example I just gave uh, will digest very quickly and provide kind of an almost immediate uh, uh, source of energy. Fiber, as I said, slows digestion. So um, we wanna make sure that our athletes are kind of avoiding really high fiber meals and snacks uh, immediately before or between um, activity, especially if they're kind of sensitive uh, with uh, their digestion, which I'll talk about a lot more when we talk about pre-workout nutrition. So our sources of carbohydrate, I, short, I shared a very similar uh, screen last night. So we've got our starches, breads, pasta, uh, potatoes, uh, beans and lentils. These are kind of what we think about as our typical kind of starchy foods. Some dairy products are also a source of carbohydrate. So specifically milk, yogurt, fruit and fruit juice is a source of carbohydrate. And then we've got uh, in the added sugar category, some kind types of uh, more refined sugars or more processed carbohydrate sources um, that I've just grouped in there. So I always like to show this kind of diagram, uh, especially when working with uh, younger athletes, just to kind of understand that yes, all of these foods contain carbohydrates, but always like to highlight that um, these kind of added sugars or more refined or processed sugars are going to be very different as a fuel source because of that uh, uh, fiber content for one and just how they've been processed. So if you're eating kind of a muffin before you head to the rink um, or something that's been a little bit more refined, you're going to have a much quicker digestion. That energy or carbohydrate from that muffin isn't going to last as long in your system because you're going to have kind of like a spike and crash in energy versus having like a whole grain slice of toast, maybe some peanut butter or sun butter, banana that's got some fiber in it, some protein, um, complex carbs, some healthy fats, that'll give you kind of a, a more gradual release of energy and something that's a lot more sustainable. And then protein is next. So protein, uh, of course, we think about as helping to kind of support and repair muscle. So uh, really important in the recovery phase of post-workout, helps our body to heal and recover. Um, a big misconception with uh, protein uh, is that it's used kind of as a fuel source during um, activity. So this is, uh, if you weren't on the call or the Zoom call last night, we had some poll questions just to kind of test the, the knowledge of our skaters. And um, the one question was, which macronutrient do we get our energy from? And quite a few uh, selected protein. So, uh, you know, and that's a very common kind of misconception that we need to kind of prep for our training with lots of protein uh, versus the carbohydrate. So protein is actually not used as a fuel source um, in an ideal scenario. So 
protein we store in our muscles. And so the only way that we're kind of burning protein or using protein as a fuel source is if we are burning muscle. And so that's never an ideal scenario. We never want to be in a state where we're breaking down muscle um, in that kind of good tissue. This only happens if we are not fueling properly. So if we don't have that carbohydrate or that glycogen energy to pull from, then the body might be kind of forced to turn to breaking down protein as a fuel source if it doesn't have carbohydrates. So this is something that we definitely want to avoid and we certainly can with proper fueling. Um, so a few considerations for athletes, uh, again, essential for that recovery period. In terms of digestion, protein is slower to digest than carbohydrates. So when we think about kind of ideally having uh, throughout the day, like a slow release of that carbohydrate energy, uh, pairing protein with our carbohydrate will help to do that. So that's always a suggestion that I have when it comes to kind of balancing snacks. Um, and then just in general for athletes, it's important to kind of get enough protein in their day, helps to maintain muscle mass, um, support their immune system, and has a lot of other benefits. So even if we're not looking to kind of bulk up or put muscle on, it's still really important just to get um, enough protein daily. Sources of protein, um, again, much more uh, straightforward. So we've got our meats, fish, uh, we've got beans and lentils, tofu, nuts and seeds, uh, nut butter, eggs, dairy. These are all kind of uh, great sources of protein in the diet. And then lastly, fat. So fats um, can, or stored fat, I should say, um, can be used for as an energy source, but only for very low intensity activity. So um, I always use the example, if we're sitting here listening to the webinar now, uh, it's possible that our body's kind of burning some fat for an energy source because we don't really need a lot of energy right now. Anytime that we kick into a more intense activity, so heart rate starts increasing, breathing starts to get labored, uh, that typically means that our body has to switch to a much more efficient uh, energy source, which is carbohydrate. Um, so typically when we're thinking of kind of high performance nutrition, uh, high intensity training, jumps, that sort of thing, it's gonna be carbohydrate driven. So for that reason, uh, you know, we don't talk about fats a whole lot in our sport nutrition uh, discussion, um, especially for these types of sports, um, but it is very important for um, overall health. So it's always something that I like to bring up anyway. Fat has lots of good overall health benefits. So we wanna make sure that athletes are still kind of including fats in their diet throughout the day. Um, it's important for healthy skin. Uh, it's important for eyesight. The brain is made out of fat. So getting lots of healthy fats in the diet is going to be uh, important for a brain perspective. Fat is also used in the digestive system to help to absorb certain fat soluble vitamins. So vitamins A, D, E, and K. These are vitamins that can only be absorbed into our digestive tract or from our digestive tract uh, with fats. So that's why having some fats at your meals and not kind of restricting fats can help from that perspective too. Some considerations uh, for our athletes, so specifically kind of related to digestion. Fats are very slow to digest. And so we do want to be cautious about having too much fat before activity or in our recovery period for activity um, because it can really slow digestion. It can increase the likelihood of getting cramps um, or just not feeling well. Um, can also cause low energy and kind of ultimately lead to uh, reduced performance. So I'll talk about that more in our pre-workout talk. And then same with recovery, too much uh, fat in our meal or snack after recovery can slow digestion as well and kind of cause us to almost miss that recovery window that we have. So I'll talk about that a little bit more um, later too. And then sources of fats. Um, so I don't think I went into this much detail uh, with the athletes, but um, always looking at kind of diet quality. So it's not just about kind of getting fats in your diet, but the healthy choices um, can make a big difference to overall health and then performance too. So certain fats um, in the diet can be anti-inflammatory, so it can help to kind of reduce inflammation. Certain fats can be more pro-inflammatory, so can kind of um, cause more inflammation. Um, and why this is important with our athletes is that when they're training at such a high level, so training daily, training for long hours a day, uh, that it's a normal kind of healthy part of the healing or recovery process to have 
a little bit of inflammation happen throughout the body. So just helping the muscles here heal after an intense training session and that sort of thing. So uh, by kind of choosing these foods that are more anti-inflammatory, so healthy fats like olive oil, nuts and seeds, salmon, avocado, nut butters, um, these fats can actually help to kind of support that recovery process, reduce inflammation and help the body kind of heal. If we're eating, you know, things like arena food or like um, deep fried foods, more processed fats, these fats can be more pro-inflammatory and kind of hinder that recovery process. So um, when it comes to diet quality, uh, this is always something that I'll also kind of bring up, although I don't think I went into that much detail last night, uh, being that it was kind of like an intro uh, discussion. All right, so next is uh, balance. So these athletes plates are what we like to use in uh, group sessions. Uh, it's very difficult to talk to specifically about how much of a certain food or food group athletes need in a group because everybody's gonna be needing uh, slightly different amounts depending on age, size, uh, male or female, all of those things. So. We like to use these plates just to kind of put that portion into perspective because it can be relatable or, or used by everyone. Uh, if you're younger, you have a smaller appetite, maybe you have a smaller plate. If you're older, have a bigger appetite, you have a larger plate. So it kind of works for, for everyone. So this just shows us uh, what the proportions uh, on a plate would be for our macronutrients or for these different food groups on a heavy training day. So what we would consider to be a heavy training day would be if the athlete is training for at least two hours or 120 minutes of vigorous activity, so all out effort. Um, in this scenario, we would suggest that half the plate is filled with grains and starches, so those carbohydrate foods. A quarter of the plate is filled with protein, so your meats, alternatives. And then the remaining quarter is filled with vegetable. And then if we contrast that to the moderate uh, training plate or the light training plate, so moderate day would be one to two hours of activity. A light day or a rest day could be up to an hour of activity. The moderate training day, we see the half the plate of greens and starches uh, adjust slightly. So we're now looking at more so a third of a plate of greens and starches. So slightly less carbohydrate demand. Vegetables then make up that remaining uh, space on the plate. And then um, in the light to uh, or rest day, those greens and starches get cut back a little bit more. And now it's a quarter of the plate. Greens and starches, half your plate vegetables, um, and you'll notice here that protein stays consistent. So our protein needs are not determined by our activity levels. Uh, protein needs are determined by our size, uh, maybe our, our body composition goals, but not uh, how much activity we're doing. So the activity that we're doing is going to be fueled by carbohydrate. So that's what we kind of can adjust on our plate or in our day based on the amount and intensity of the activity that we're doing. And then in terms of meal timing and energy, um, so the suggestion that I always have is to try and aim for a balanced meal or snack every two to four hours throughout the day. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is that our athletes are training uh, at high intensity and they're training uh, for maybe long duration, long days, or what have you. Um, and they have higher energy needs or all overall nutrient needs than uh, someone their age that isn't training. So we wanna make sure that they have enough opportunity throughout the day to actually get in all the nutrients that they need. If we're missing breakfast or lunch or snacks, it just gives us less opportunity to actually physically eat the food that we need to eat in order to meet those energy or nutrient demands. So that's one reason. The other reason is kind of what I alluded to earlier about energy levels. So ideally we would like to have kind of consistent energy levels, constantly be getting a little bit of carbohydrate in throughout the day to kind of build up those glycogen stores in preparation for when we do train, um, not letting our energy levels dip too low, and then you know have to kind of rebound and have a massive meal and have these big kind of um, peaks and valleys in our energy levels throughout the day. So that two to four hour window um, is what we suggest. And 
Of course, it depends on training schedules and whatnot. Uh, it doesn't always work out perfectly, but this is kind of what we try and aim for as kind of an ideal for energy levels. Um, if somebody's really struggling with meeting their needs, uh, they can kind of shrink and have something every two hours um, or whatnot. We typically want to have two hours between our meals just to kind of give our digestion a break. But um, beyond that, we can kind of use this guideline as kind of a way to get those regular, me regular meals and snacks in and help to meet uh, overall nutrition needs. And this is kind of what that looks like um, in a different kind of visual. So if we look here, the green line, uh, we see kind of three uh, peaks and three dips. That would be an example of how somebody's energy levels would fluctuate throughout the day, say with three meals. So we've got kind of bigger peaks, bigger dips. Um, in those dips, the athlete might feel like they're starving, have to kind of eat a large amount of food and then kind of get that crash from eating a large amount of food and just have those kind of uh, roller coaster of energy levels throughout the day. So ideally we wanna aim for more of that blue line in the middle and have kind of more controlled and sustained energy levels throughout the day, avoiding any kind of big peaks or dips. And then essentially um, the kind of uh, tip that I always use is we're energizing with carbohydrates. So we're getting our energy from carbohydrate and we're helping to sustain that energy um, with protein. So that's kind of an, an easy way to kind of remember it. Um, and when we talk about balance, we're talking about kind of high fiber carbs, good quality carbohydrates, slow digesting paired with protein. And then usually there's some healthy fats in there too. And that just helps to kind of give you that good um, sustained energy. So next I'm gonna talk uh, just briefly about um, REDS or relative energy deficiency in sports. This is kind of a new term uh, or newer term um, in sport, but uh, it's a condition that can happen with chronic underfueling. So I thought uh, it's tough to have kind of a sport nutrition talk without bringing this up. And this could very much be something that you've heard many times before. Maybe this is new for you, but I just thought I would introduce it um, in case it, it wasn't something that you're, everybody is aware of. So REDS is the kind of short uh, form term for this. And it kind of stems from the female athlete triad that we've kind of known about for years. So you may have heard of this before, female athlete triad. It's a condition that happens when there is low energy availability. So the top of this triangle or triad, we've got low energy availability, which means that there is not enough calories coming in to support the uh, calories that are needed for training. This can happen for a couple of reasons. Uh, one could be purposeful restriction, maybe for the purpose of weight loss or body composition. Uh, or two, it could be, you know, not purposeful restriction, but just that the athlete isn't getting enough in for whatever reason, uh, maybe scheduling, uh, planning, what have you, uh, but for whatever reason, they're just not eating enough to sustain uh, or to, su to support the large amount of energy that they're putting out. Um, what this kind of ends up um, causing, so in females specifically, we're talking here, um, low energy coming in means kind of weight loss, low body fat stores. This ends up resulting in irregular period or amenorrhea is what we uh, use to term um, just no period or a lack of period in uh, women of, of menstruating age. Um, and the kind of hormonal uh, irregularities that can happen here ultimately can lead to in, in years, uh, kind of low bone density and an increased risk for osteoporosis, uh, bone breaks uh, and that sort of thing. So this is kind of the, the term that we've known about for years, but what we've kind of learned in more recent uh, years is that this uh, syndrome is much more complex than just a uh, female. So it affects females and males in different ways. Um, and, and it has way more effects than we kind of understood. So it's way more complex than just this little triad, but that's kind of where this stems from. So REDS can occur in male and female athletes, and it's caused by chronic underfueling or a chronic energy deficit. So just chronically underfueled, not getting enough calories in. It can impact both physical and mental health and can have both short-term and long-term consequences. So 
This is a, um, a visual chart that I, I love. It just kind of highlights, uh, kind of sums up REDS very well. Um, this is taken from uh, the IOC has a number of uh, research articles available online and they, um, I just kind of snapped this out of there. So if you're interested in learning more information, you could definitely look those up. But this kind of helps to highlight the uh, symptoms or what can happen from just being chronically underfueled. So we might see decreased endurance performance. Um, we might see increased injury risk. So if we have an athlete that just continues to get injured or has injuries that aren't healing properly, that could signal that, okay, maybe this athlete's nutrition um, is, is uh, kind of contributing. A decreased training response. So if your athlete just isn't able to kind of take on that increased uh, load as uh, some of your other athletes are, can affect that kind of mental health or concentration, impaired judgment, decreased coordination, decreased concentration. Um, in kind of the short term, irritability um, can affect mental health from a kind of depression standpoint too. We'd of course see decreased glycogen stores because the athlete isn't fueling enough to support the, the energy demands. Um, decreased muscle strength as well. So it's kind of a, it's a very complex uh, scenario, but I guess we just wanna make sure that we're um, our athletes are, are kind of fueling properly because it, it has much more of an impact than just that physical immediate performance. So what can you do? I think being aware is the first thing. So as coaches, you are in direct uh, contact with athletes every day. Um, so you would, uh, you know, maybe see some of these signs and just being aware is, uh, is very positive. For example, you know, years ago, we thought that when female athletes didn't get their period, um, it was normal, right? So this now we know, okay, this isn't normal and can be a sign that um, maybe we're under fueling. Um, so just uh, encouraging fueling opportunities during long training sessions as needed, positive messaging around food, body image, um, and then just knowing your local resources. So if you do have an athlete that you're kind of concerned about knowing, you know, who you can refer the family to. Um, and just having awareness that this uh, type of condition does exist. All right, so getting back to our nutrition. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about pre-workout nutrition here and how to kind of fuel properly. So pre-workout nutrition really uh, depends on digestion. So when we're talking about what to eat pre-workout, all we're kind of focusing really on is digestion. So this chart here helps to highlight uh, the differences in how long it takes our body to digest carbohydrates versus protein and fat. So I've kind of alluded this to already, but it helps to have this kind of visual. So carbohydrates, depending on the fiber content, uh, typically take less than two hours to digest on their own. Protein takes a little bit longer. So of course, depending on the type of protein and portion, but we're looking at about two to five hours to digest. And fats take the longest to digest. And here we're looking at four to nine hours, again, depending on the amount um, that you're having. So to kind of put this into perspective, I like to use this uh, type of chart. So here we've got our three macronutrients. Carbs takes up that, that largest slice of, uh, of uh, or the largest triangle here, uh, because that again is what's kind of uh, driving our training. So that's what we wanna fuel up on the most. So that's our main focus for any pre-workout nutrition. Protein's also there in a slightly smaller slice and will kind of reduce as we get closer to training. And then fats are there as well in the lowest amount. And again, we kind of cut them back as we get closer to training. So we like to use the three, two, one rule um, of pre-workout nutrition, which basically means that uh, what we have, so the foods that we eat and the portion of those foods should be determined by how much time you have before training. So if you're eating something three to four hours before, or if you're eating something two hour, hours before you train, uh, you'd kind of think about that time that you have left and determine how much to eat and, and the types of food to eat based on that. So a couple of things with digestion. One is that it's different for everybody. So what works for one skater might not work for the other. Um, so this is kind of what we like to use as a guide and then um, knowing that, you know, some athletes are, are not going to fit into this mold and might have to adjust outside of this. So typically, 
Uh, if we have three to four hours uh, before training, that's typically enough time to digest a full balanced meal. So uh, a full balanced meal would be, for example, those athletes plates that we just looked at previously. We've got some other examples here, pasta with some cauliflower and chicken. We've got chickpeas, rice and spinach, uh, breakfast with some oats, nuts and seeds and fruit. Uh, so our focus here is carbohydrate, but we're also including some protein, some healthy fats in there. Uh, because we've got time to kind of digest that all. As we get a little bit closer to the two hour uh, mark before training, this is when we no longer have enough time to digest a full meal. Um, so we're looking at kind of smaller portions of food. We're still focusing on carbohydrate. We're including some protein um, and a little bit of fats are okay too, but we don't want that to be a main part of this uh, snack. So this two hour uh, meal or snack could be kind of a smaller portion of the meal that you would have had two hours ago. It could be something like a smoothie with some Greek yogurt and fruit, something like yogurt with granola and fruit uh, shown here, trail mix with nuts and seeds and dried fruit. Um, again, our, our focus here is carbohydrate, but we also wanna make sure that we're including protein here because whatever we're eating here needs to hold us to our training and then kind of beyond. So we wanna make sure that we're able to sustain that energy that we're getting from carbohydrate with a little bit of protein here. And then when we get to the one hour mark uh, before training, this is when most athletes are most sensitive and prone to cramping and some kind of digestive symptoms. So this is where uh, we don't really have enough time to digest much protein, fats. So we really want to focus on carbs only here. We're looking for a quick source of energy because we're gonna be training in an hour. Um, so we're looking for something that's easy to digest. Banana works for a lot of athletes. Applesauce, a simple granola bar um, often works too. So some athletes might choose to not have anything at the one hour, but they just have to kind of plan ahead to make sure that they had a meal three to four hours before or a snack or whatnot. So this is not to say that athletes should be eating at all of these occasions, but it just means that what you have in the portion should be kind of determined by how much time you have left. And then there's also some differences to, again, with digestion um, for the individual. So for example, if uh, your skaters are doing very long training sessions and tend to get hungry uh, you know, sooner than a break would be, they might want to include a little bit more protein closer to training than what this graph shows as tolerated. Um, it just depends. Some athletes are, are used to a higher fiber diet. And so a little bit more fiber in this time period might not bother them at all. So it just kind of depends um, on the athlete, but this is kind of what we like to use as a guide. And our goals with pre-workout nutrition is that we want to be digested so that we can use this energy from this meal and snack. And then we want to avoid those uh, nasty symptoms from having food kind of sit in our stomach. And then here's just another example of that and how, depending on the scenario, uh, some foods might work in some instances and not in others. So here we've got an example of a breakfast. So maybe this individual had a white bagel and a glass of orange juice. So this breakfast is at 8 a.m. and we're seeing kind of a big spike in blood sugar or energy levels and then a big kind of crash uh, afterwards. So if this is an early morning training session and the athlete's training at say 8.30, um, this might be a good pre-workout snack because the peak of this energy that's available is happening exactly when training's happening. Um, so in this instance, it might be a good thing um, to have something that's very quick digesting. If say training is, um, you know, further down, maybe at uh, 10 o'clock, for example, um, that energy that we saw in that first spike is going to be kind of gone by the time they're training. So that's not ideal in that scenario. So in this example, we've got some whole grain bread, uh, banana, peanut butter, a glass of milk. We've got some protein here um, and healthy fats. We've got complex carbs and fiber from our bread and banana. Um, and that's just kind of helping to sustain our energy a little bit longer to take us to uh, when we're doing that workout. So just another example of kind of how the digestion can uh, change depending on the scenario. All right, so now to uh, discuss a little bit about hydration, um, especially important these days when it's so warm out. So hydration is often something that we kind of forget about. We don't maybe focus on it so much, 
but it is just as important as uh, the food that we eat. Um, it's just something that's very kind of under uh, underappreciated, I guess. So for anyone who's a numbers person, I like to use these and I had these uh, last night at our uh, meeting, uh, just some numbers or stats or percentages to kind of put things into perspective. So 2% is the level of dehydration that starts to impact performance. So 2% dehydration means we've lost 2% of our body weight in, uh, in sweat or in fluid. Um, it's a very slight level of dehydration. It's not something that you would feel dehydrated from. It's not something that you'd feel dizzy or any of those things. Um, and then 3% dehydration is the level of dehydration that starts to cause us to feel thirsty. So if you've heard that saying before, by the time you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. It's kind of true here. Um, you're not significantly dehydrated, but you are past the point where it will start to impact performance. So we like to always kind of recommend that athletes are proactive with their hydration. Um, and I'll share some tips to do that. Um, and the impact on performance can be pretty significant. So 10% um, impact on performance uh, when dehydrated. So it can be fairly significant um, and, and something that's super important. Just quickly here. So I don't know if there's a slide for hydration, but we haven't seen the slides change. Are you changing them on your end? Oh, I did. Okay, let's have a look at that. Oh, and we actually have a question from a coach that has come in. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so that worked on our end. I can see the change in the slide. Okay, sorry um, about that. I must say something. No problem. No problem at all. So we had a question come in from a coach. Uh, I know it was something we chatted about last night as well. Uh, many athletes train first in the early morning for two to three hours. They typically roll out of bed and head to the rink. What is recommended to fuel for this early morning workout? Something that could sustain the energy throughout the morning. Yeah, so um, yeah, let me flip back here so we can just kind of have that visual. So um, good question and definitely a common challenge. Um, and I think we said last night that, you know, if you have an 80 gram training session, you're looking at this chart, you're thinking, okay, what time do I have to wake up in the morning to have my full breakfast? Um, so I always suggest that training on something is better than training on empty. Um, so a couple of things, if the athlete's able to tolerate uh, carbohydrate with some protein, that's ideal. So assuming that the training session is probably going to be, you know, a fairly long one that they need to be sustained for having some carbohydrate with protein is going to be ideal kind of as tolerated. So if the athlete's able to tolerate, you know, whole grain toast, a banana and peanut butter or an egg, um, that's great. Uh, peanut butter would be kind of quicker in the morning, I guess. Um, if they're a little bit more sensitive, maybe they have a white bread with, um, you know, peanut butter, and that'll be kind of a lower fiber um, with a glass of juice instead of the banana. Um, so if they're able to tolerate carbs and some protein, that's ideal. Um, if they're more sensitive and they can just tolerate carbohydrate, I think uh, have that. So a banana, applesauce uh, will be easier to digest. And then potentially, um, if it is a long training session, uh, having some kind of a liquid form of carbohydrate, if they're really not able to eat much first thing in the morning, could be a good way, um, like a juice, uh, to just kind of keep those energy stores up if they're not able to kind of fuel in the morning. And then the other thing I always like to remind uh, athletes about is that what you eat the night before will also help. So if you know you're not going to be kind of a big eater in the morning pre-workout, make sure you have a solid dinner at night, like half your plate, carbohydrates, um, so that you can kind of build up those stores overnight. And even a snack before bed, if you have an early dinner with some carbs and protein, that will help in the morning as well. Um, Was awesome. that the only question? That's it so far, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh, in terms of hydration, um, so we know it has a significant impact on performance. Uh, if anyone's b before been dehydrated, it affects, you know, mental focus as well. Um, causes us to be kind of, you know, unfocused, uh, less clarity and that sort of thing. So uh, the tips that we have, I mean, the biggest thing is to always have a water bottle in sight for athletes, like whatever you're doing during the day. Um, the goal is to show up at the arena or at your training center already hydrated. So a lot of this work has to be done at home. 
Um, so always having a water bottle kind of taking sips throughout the day. If it's in front of you um, in sight, you're likely to drink more. Um, it's hard to get too specific with actual uh, fluid needs in this scenario because everyone's needs would be different. It's dependent on sweat rate and that sort of thing. Um, during a workout, um, so assuming that the workout is kind of a high intensity and one that uh, the athletes are sweating, um, the uh, kind of guideline that we use is if they take a sip of water every 15 minutes, that tends to be enough to maintain hydration during a high intensity activity. Um, so that's kind of our, our during uh, training suggestion, um, assuming that they've kind of showed up already hydrated. So, um, but yeah, the biggest thing is kind of for them to just kind of be aware and know that, you know, there is a bit of a having to be proactive with drinking water, because if you're not used to drinking water, you're probably not going to feel that thirst. And if you're relying on that thirst to uh, be triggered to drink water, um, you might be risking kind of a little bit of dehydration. And then this is something that uh, we like to use kind of as a visual for uh, hydration. So again, uh, individual skaters, uh, fluid needs will be different, um, but we like to use the example of urine color as kind of a way that the individual can tell their hydration status. So in terms of our urine color, we're aiming for a pale yellow. So not necessarily having to be totally clear. That's always a question I get. Um, if your urine is totally clear, it might mean that you're slightly overhydrated. So not a, a bad thing, but um, just not necessary. So a pale yellow color is what we're looking for. Um, and that can be a way that kind of the individual can uh, monitor their own hydration status and kind of make sure that they are staying properly hydrated. All right, so that was our kind of pre-workout. And now we're going to cover our recovery nutrition. So um, what I mean by recovery is the kind of fuel or the meal or snack that we're having immediately after a workout. Um, and there are a number of benefits to having a recovery meal or snack. Uh, in the short term, it helps to increase energy, helps to manage hunger levels. So um, preventing uh, energy levels from dipping too low to the point where you're kind of ravenous and, and over hungry. Uh, there's a bigger protein synthesis response. So if we're, if our goal of kind of recovering after training is to heal our muscles, it's going to be um, easier to do that in this recovery window. We're also wanting to refill glycogen stores. So we've just used up a bunch of carbohydrate stores during training. We want to kind of refill those as soon as possible. And then it also helps to support the immune system because again, uh, you know, your body doesn't understand kind of why you're going through this physical training. Uh, it doesn't know if you're kind of training on purpose or running from a bear sort of thing. So um, training can be hard on the body. And so by kind of uh, helping to refuel and helping your body heal after training, it just kind of supports your, your immune system and overall health as well. And then in the long term, um, helps to prevent illness and, and injury. So just again, having that recovered body, your less risk of injury, and can help to support any adaptation to kind of uh, greater training loads um, and help your body kind of adapt to, uh, to kind of larger um, or different types of, of training routines. So the uh, kind of tips that we use for recovery, just that's easy to remember, uh, we have the three R's. So essentially we're looking to replace what we've lost. So we've burned up a bunch of glycogen stores or, or carbohydrate stores. So we wanna refuel with carbohydrate. Uh, any type of intense training causes some little damage in muscles. So we wanna help to rebuild and recover those muscles with our protein. And then uh, in an intense training session, we've probably sweat. Um, so our goal for hydration is to kind of replace what we've sweat. So we want to kind of uh, rehydrate with some fluid as well. And the ideal window that we have here is within one hour of training. This is when, again, that protein synthesis response is much um, stronger. The muscles are kind of open and ready to take in that carbohydrate. So that refueling process is a lot more efficient. Uh, if it's within that one hour window, if we let it go a little bit longer, it'll just take again, that much more uh, nutrition to kind of get back to that fully fueled state. And then uh, some of the recovery snack ideas that I shared uh, last night with the group, 
we've got, uh, so just, you know, carbohydrate protein. So we've got some easy to digest soda crackers there um, with some cheese, uh, banana with peanut butter. We have Greek yogurt and a granola bar. We've got uh, some mixed items, so milk or a smoothie. Uh, both would have, uh, milk would have protein and carbs. Smoothie would have kind of, uh, assuming that you're using some fruit, maybe Greek yogurt or protein powder, you'd have both of those in there. Or a trail mix is a great kind of grab and go option uh, with some nuts or seeds for protein and then dried fruit in there as well for carbohydrate. And then uh, lastly, I'll just run through some of the competition day uh, tips that I shared uh, with the group last night. Again, just so we're uh, all on the same page here. So our goals for competition day, um, of course, uh, in the pre-competition days, our goal is to build up those glycogen stores as much as possible. So we want to head into competition day with that full uh, gas tank uh, or full tank of energy. So the, my suggestion is to follow the heavy training day plate. So regardless of, of your actual training on those days or the skater's actual training schedule on those days, follow that heavy training plate to allow your body to kind of gradually build up those glycogen stores. So if you've heard before, kind of like carbohydrate loading for marathon runners or et cetera, or that uh, type of thing, uh, similar concept here, just maybe less dramatic. Um, but we want to, again, kind of build up those glycogen stores so that we can show up on competition day with that full um, muscles full of energy. And then again, night before dinner is going to be super important, especially if uh, we've got some nerves happening in the morning and you might not be hungry for a full breakfast or if it's an early competition start. Uh, so eating a good full balanced meal the night before, maybe even a snack before bed if you're an early uh, dinner person uh, will help to kind of fuel up as well. On competition day, our goal is to, as best as possible, maintain those glycogen stores. So we want to try and maintain that energy store as much as possible. So again, trying to maintain that meal or snack every two to four hours as able. So of course, depending on the actual schedule on competition day, it might not always be perfect, um, but that's kind of still remains to be our goal. Even if those meals and snacks are smaller or whatnot, we still want to try and have that every two to four hour kind of uh, some kind of nutrition coming in to maintain those energy stores as much as possible. And then um, the tip is, you know, it'll be kind of being proactive on competition day and doing some planning. So knowing uh, the skaters, knowing their schedule um, and kind of planning ahead what they think will work for them on competition day to have those foods with them. Uh, you know, it might not work out perfectly day of with nerves and, and whatnot, but at least if you're kind of planning ahead to know, okay, I've got a two hour break here, I've got uh, a long span here without a break or whatnot, um, and knowing kind of your stomach and what works for you can help to at least uh, show up with uh, what would likely be the most ideal scenario for meals and snacks. Um, and then using familiar foods. So competition day is never a day where you want to try something new. So hopefully athletes are using kind of foods that are familiar to them, that they know work for them, help them feel good, energized. Um, and then I always suggest bringing multiple water bottles. I know there's lots of refill stations around arenas, but, um, you know, sometimes uh, you just don't want that kind of barrier to staying hydrated. Um, and just taking kind of sips throughout the day. Again, ideally we've kind of done our hydration and we've showed up that morning hydrated. And so it'll just be a matter of kind of having some sips throughout the day to kind of maintain that hydration status. And then some other examples that we talked about. So um, again, preparing in advance. So some kind of grab and go options would be things like energy bites or even bars. Um, you know, so these might not be things, especially a prepackaged bar that you, uh, you know, the skater might be relying on day to day, but maybe on competition day, it's kind of a good concentration, concentrated source of energy and uh, might be a good option there. Trail mix can be a good option because you can kind of adjust the portion. You can have more or less depending on how much time you have and what you need. Um, lots of, uh, Skaters, I'm sure, rely on kind of smoothies for morning. So if you are a smoothie person, um, I suggested even kind of pre-packing your smoothie ingredients into a bag. So throw your strawberries or frozen fruit, spinach into a baggie, and then you can kind of just take that out of the freezer in the morning and kind of have that uh, one last thing to think about that morning when you're um, getting ready and having breakfast. 
Overnight oats can be a great option to kind of take with you. Uh, you can eat them cold. So if anyone hasn't made overnight oats before, there's tons of recipes online, uh, but you essentially kind of put your oats, your liquid, uh, sometimes yogurt, sometimes fruit into a container. The oats will absorb the liquid overnight. And so you don't have to cook them and you can eat it cold. Um, making egg cups. So there's little like muffin tin egg uh, mini quiches or mini omelets that lots of people will make and that can be a great kind of uh, quick and easy protein source. Quinoa salad, wraps, bean salads, um, wraps with leftover protein can be good options as well. And then uh, you know bringing a, a cooler bag or some kind of a, a travel toiletry bag can work as well with an ice pack to keep things cold, just so we're practicing food safety and limiting any risk of kind of uh, getting uh, sick from what we eat um, is a good thing as well. I know arenas are cold, but uh, it might not be cold enough to kind of keep your food to the proper temperature. And then uh, lastly are some tips for nerves or nausea. So these things or uh, these tips will uh, apply for early morning training for those who feel nauseous in the morning and can't, you know, imagine having anything to eat before training or on competition day where nerves um, are uh, going on and that's kind of affecting appetite. So some tips here. One is to aim for small frequent snacks. So if you're feeling uh, nauseous or nervous, the last thing you want to do, you know, is eat a full meal. It's just not going to be very appealing. Um, so breaking that into smaller bites of food. So even having like some small energy bites, that's where maybe a little energy bar or a half bar can kind of uh, come into play because it's just kind of less volume needed and having uh, more frequent so that you don't have to kind of have those large meals. Uh, using liquids as kind of a tool. So a liquid form of carbohydrate. Liquids, as I mentioned, require very little digestion because they're already liquid. Um, so they're much easier on the stomach. And it's always easier to kind of drink something than to eat something when you're not feeling so well. So a simple smoothie, uh, milk has some uh, carbs and protein, or a juice can be just kind of like an easy source of carbohydrate. Avoid high fiber foods if you're not feeling well or feeling a little nervous or nauseous because these are just slower to digest. So this is a good thing most times, but if your stomach isn't feeling 100%, uh, having food kind of sit there longer might uh, exacerbate those uh, symptoms. So try something like a banana, uh, some soda crackers, a couple of dates, a uh, slice of bread, just something that's kind of uh, lower uh, fiber. Uh, focusing on nutrient dense foods. So if we're thinking, okay, I'm not hungry, uh, you want to get the most nutrition out of the smallest volume of food possible. So this is where something like a dried fruit can come into play because you can get the same carbohydrate from a larger fruit, but in a much smaller volume, which is easier to eat. Uh, if you're not feeling well, something like juice is concentrated, nuts and seeds. Um, so just taking advantage of those kind of very nutrient dense foods that do exist. And then uh, my tip always is just uh, for skaters to kind of remember that something is better than nothing. So rather than kind of writing off eating all together in the morning, uh, for example, um, having something is gonna be better than nothing. So even a few bites of food, even a few soda crackers, uh, some applesauce will help to provide the, the skaters with more energy and then ultimately help them to tolerate more food over time. So you might get used to kind of eating when you're a little bit nervous or you might get used to eating first thing in the morning and over weeks and weeks and weeks, gradually be able to have kind of a, a proper breakfast or something that's a little bit more substantial. And then some portable options here, uh, lots of uh, options. So we've got uh, granola bars, uh, nut butter and crackers. Uh, pumpkin seeds can be a great alternative to uh, nuts for nut allergies. Um, we've got prepackaged cheese, canned tuna, shelf stable. Um, cheese uh, sticks can also work as well as kind of easy, convenient protein options. Those applesauce kind of squeeze containers can be convenient because uh, you don't even need a uh, spoon. The individual packed hummus is great. Dried fruit, trail mix, as I mentioned, uh, roasted chickpeas or uh, beans or lentils. There's roasted chickpeas and roasted lentils on the market, but those can be kind of a great crunchy snack and they've got both uh, protein and carbs. 
Uh, Greek yogurt is a great protein source. Uh, boiled eggs last in their shells for up to five days in the fridge. So you can kind of boil a bunch of them if you enjoy boiled eggs and kind of grab and go as you need. Fruit, of course, is always portable. Um, yogurt drinks, if you need, um, can be a good option too. So always uh, whole foods and less processed foods are going to be ideal. But, um, you know, know that these tools are available if, uh, if needed. Um, to help to still make kind of healthier choices than maybe kind of picking up something um, at the arena or whatnot. All right, so uh, just to summarize, um, so we talked about carbs, protein, and fat, carbs being the energizer, protein helping to sustain that energy. We talked about the three, two, one rule for pre-workout nutrition. So essentially athletes are kind of uh, suggested to pair uh, the portion and types of food based on the time that they have before training. Um, always athletes carry a water bottle with, uh, should carry a water bottle with them at all times. Recovery nutrition, we've got the three R's. So refueling with carbs, rebuilding with protein, and then rehydrating with fluid. And then planning ahead for competition days or for difficult schedules. Um, if we can kind of encourage this, uh, it's always the hardest part of healthy eating, but it can have the, the biggest impact. All right. Um, so if anybody has any questions at this point. Awesome. Thanks, Brittany. Great information again. That is awesome. Um, so we will just wait and see. We have a few questions that have come in. So, and coaches, please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type those in the chat box now. Um, a few questions that have come in. So, Brittany, we'll just start with, uh, there's a question about sports drinks. Um, I don't believe you specifically covered the sports drinks in the um, presentation. So, if you want to talk to us a little bit about those and sure. benefits, uh, pros, cons, that sort of thing. Sure. So, sports drinks, um, can be a, a tool. So when we think about sports drinks, we're thinking about a liquid form of carbohydrate and some electrolytes as well. Um, so this question is always very common, the question of, you know, do we need to use sports drinks? Are they uh, beneficial and that sort of thing? So um, I don't have kind of a yes or no answer, but uh, I have a couple of different scenarios where they may or may not be appropriate. So in general, if uh, you know our athletes are having regular breaks throughout their training, they're able to have grab a snack, have lots of fluid. Um, typically, a sports drink won't be uh, always necessary. The scenarios where it will be necessary are you know days like today. Say if we're doing any outdoor training or something like that, it's really humid. We're sweating a ton. Uh, sports drink will probably be a good idea just to maintain hydration. Our kind of rule of thumb or guideline with uh, the use of sports drinks is anything up to 90 minutes of activity. Um, water has been shown to be just as effective at hydrating than a sport drink. But when we get beyond that 90 minutes of activity, that's when uh, the sport drink can add that kind of added benefit of a little bit of carbohydrate and some electrolyte support as well. Okay, so that's good. Uh, knowing that timing on that is helpful for sure. Mm -hmm. so that's awesome. Thank you. Um, any idea, any suggestions on the nut-free snacks for anyone with a nut allergy? Yes, and uh, I'm sure uh, with kind of nut allergies, um, even whole training centers might be nut-free too. So even if you, um, your, uh, you know, even if one team member doesn't have a nut allergy, you might still. Uh, Kind of need to have nut free options. So um, the challenge with nut free often comes down to the protein part piece um, because carbohydrates, you know, we've got fruit and that sort of thing, and those are often going to be nut free anyway. Um, for protein, so uh, as kind of a direct substitute for, uh, say, peanut butter as an example, peanut butter can be a great kind of convenient option for to pair with fruit or to have in a sandwich. Um, as a direct alternative, there are uh, nut-free uh, butter alternatives. So something like a sun butter is made with sunflower seeds instead of nuts. So that can be a nut-free spread. Tastes the same as nut butter, but just like sunflower seeds. Or wow butter is a soy base, um, and that can be an alternative as well. Um, so those two products are available at most stores, and the protein content is uh, very comparable to a traditional nut butter. 
Um, also things like dairy uh, options, so cheese, Greek yogurt, those are going to be great protein sources um, that are nut free or um, alternative seed sources like pumpkin seeds, for example, um, can be a great nut free alternative to um, almonds or any other types of nuts. Um, there's also a good brand um, called Enjoy Life. If you have anyone with an allergy in your home, you might be familiar, but Enjoy Life makes, um, is 100% allergen free. So they are nut free, dairy free, gluten free, um, all of the priority allergens. And they make some trail mixes and energy bites that are allergen friendly. So those are great as kind of a grab and go option um, as well. And they're available at most uh, grocery stores too. Awesome. Okay. Can you speak a little bit to, we do have a, a coach that asked about um, the amount of fluids that a skater might lose during training um, and that they don't, um, they've read that skaters don't necessarily lose a lot of fluids when on the ice compared to other sports. Um, can you comment on that at all? Yeah. So I would say um, that's likely true. Um, it's not necessarily a high sweat sport. Um, so I would say that's likely true. Um, typically, in order to find out kind of the exact fluid that you're losing, uh, one thing that you can do is kind of take a body weight before and after training and find out kind of exactly what the athletes are losing. Um, and then we would want to kind of replace the sweat. But, but I think you're right. It, it is the kind of on ice training uh, would probably be a, a lower sweat and lower fluid loss. Um, session. Any kind of strength training might be a little bit different, but um, yeah, I can't say kind of averages, um, but I, I think you're, you're right in that kind of uh, thought. And so it would more so be, I would say the biggest concern would be kind of the at home and showing up to the rink already hydrated and then just taking yep. those kind of sips throughout um, at every break to kind of maintain that hydration. But um, but yeah, I, I agree. It wouldn't be kind of a really high uh, fluid loss. Uh, Not like scenario. somebody necessarily outside playing soccer or something in the exactly. heat. Exactly. would be different for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, can you speak of the, uh, to the importance of calcium and iron? Um, you know, why they're so important, those two minerals, for example, why they're so important and, you know, if, if athletes should be taking extra vitamins and minerals. Yep. So calcium, uh, I'll speak to you first. So calcium, of course, is uh, what our bones are made out of. So um, always important for all of our athletes who are, um, you know, doing any kind of work that can be um, put us at risk of kind of injury and that sort of thing. Um, also athletes who are expending a lot of energy, as I said, if we're kind of not getting enough in that puts us at risk of, of possible kind of bone losses. So, um, calcium is best absorbed from food sources. So I would say if we can get our calcium from food, that's ideal, uh, more so than a supplement, I wouldn't recommend kind of a blanket calcium supplement. Um, but I would say we do want to make sure that we're getting a few servings a day of uh, dairy or alternatives. So if we're not a milk drinker, um, most almond milks or um, other alternatives have a comparable calcium content to them. Um, it is tough to get calcium from foods that aren't dairy or dairy alternatives because those are just especially high. Um, other food sources would be things like tofu, almonds, uh, leafy greens, um, but you have to eat quite a lot of them to get enough. So if we're aiming to get um, two to three servings of dairy or dairy alternatives, um, then that typically can be uh, enough for most people in kind of a general sense. Iron is also really important um, for any uh, sport that is, um, has kind of like a foot strike. So anything that you're kind of jumping landing your feet, um, that actual foot strike causes uh, our red blood cells to break down a little bit and causes us to lose a little bit of iron. So if we're in any kind of sport where you're running or doing kind of jumps, um, iron needs might be a little bit higher, uh, especially for female athletes, but not only for female athletes, but especially for female athletes who are of menstruating age um, and are having those additional losses uh, each month. So iron is a I, I think the most common deficiency, um, especially a concern in women or female athletes um, and, and in athletes in general. 
Iron though is not one that we want to supplement without having a blood test and having confirmed actual low iron. So that's not one that we want to just kind of supplement out of a precaution. Um, some symptoms of iron deficiency would be kind of like fatigue, paleness, uh, fatigue being kind of a big one that we would probably notice first. If that's the case, you want to see your doctor get a blood test and then your doctor can uh, kind of confirm um, or the athlete's doctor can confirm that they do have a deficiency and then recommend the supplement. Um, too much iron can be dangerous from supplements. So that's why we don't want to just kind of take it uh, willy nilly. Um, but yeah, both, uh, both really important. So good questions. Awesome. Uh, we're going to end with one last question just about athletes who are either gluten free uh, or possibly vegan. So, and you know, when they're traveling, the challenges that uh, that presents. So any suggestions for athletes who have dietary needs such as gluten-free and vegan? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so both a challenge certainly and especially for traveling. Any, any allergy or um, intolerance or dietary concern, I think it unfortunately puts a little bit more of a burden on the planning piece and kind of planning ahead. Um, Thankfully, these days, uh, but it depends where you go, most kind of restaurants understand allergies and can be a little bit more uh, uh, kind of helpful with, with recommendations. But um, I would say for the athlete and the family to kind of look and do a little bit of research beforehand to kind of check out the local restaurants, you know, is there a, a you know, what places can you actually eat at just to kind of do the work ahead of time so you're not stuck. And then packing as much as possible ahead of time, especially snacks. So if you got some, if you have some packaged things, some trail mix, um, things that you can kind of bring with you, and then you can um, kind of make even breakfast oats or something in the morning, gluten-free oats in the morning, have your snacks throughout the day. And then you've just got those kind of fewer options that you need to kind of go out for. Um, but I think doing as much research ahead of time as possible um, is the most helpful. And then in terms of vegan, um, we can certainly uh, eat and get enough protein and nutrients on a vegan diet. The biggest thing would be protein. Um, and I would say same thing. We'd want to kind of prepare ahead, pack protein foods, especially um, as much as possible, just to uh, make sure that you've got those options in case you, you know, I would say most places have kind of protein options for vegetarian and vegans these days, but depends on where you are. So not always. Um, so doing as much research ahead of time and then packing as much kind of protein options, bring some nuts and seeds, um, maybe dairy free yogurts or things that you typically have at home um, and store those in the hotel room and kind of uh, have those options for um, with you as much as possible. Awesome. Great tips. Um, so I think that that is it for our questions from our okay. coaches. So Brittany, thank you so much for all of the great information on behalf of Skate Ontario and all of our coaches. Uh, thank you for joining us again tonight, tying in uh, with our coaches what we covered with our skaters yesterday. Uh, great information. Thank you very much. And thank you coaches for joining us again for another webinar tonight. And stay tuned for more information on future webinars that we will be having. So thanks, Brittany. Thank you, everybody. Take care and have a great night. Thank Thanks you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.